Hi, everyone. Thanks for making it possible for me to come to Bangalore. That's awesome. Um, so, um, yeah, I used to be a cook. Um, I cooked food that looked a lot like this. Um, we would stack food. We would put uh, oil and vinegar and beautiful sauces around the plates. Um, we knew all of our farmers that we would get food from. This is actually a, a field of lettuce from one of our producers that um, we would give them our used frying oil and then they would create fuel for their tractors with it and then they would create more food which we would then keep recycling this kind of system which made me really happy. Um, we would have full animals often in our fridge. Um, we never had this guy but I think he's doing duck face so I wanted a picture of him. Um, yeah, so on a busy dinner rush, it sometimes is amazing. You would, you would feel like you were dancing kind of with the cook that you were working next to. Um, I, I also think that a, a busy dinner rush is kind of a, it's, it's a good way to think about kind of the differences between concurrency and parallel, parallelism, which is hard for me to say. Um, the kind of the pans that you have on top of the stove, maybe you have four pans that are cooking um, different kinds of potatoes and vegetables, maybe you have two pieces of salmon in the oven. Um, at the same time, all of those things are happening. So that's happening in parallel. But then when you actually have to dish up the items, you have, you put four plates down, your mashed potatoes down on each plate, and then your chicken down on each plate, and then your sauce down, and you put all the plates in the, up, or on the, in the window. That's more of kind of like a con concurrency model. And then sequential would be like, I put one plate down, I put one potatoes down, chicken, one plate in the window. So this is a good way for me to wrap my head around kind of the difference between those two things. Um, this is me next to a goat. My name's Aaron. I am a freelancer. I build usual, usually minimum viable products for small startups using Ruby and SumGo, and um, I'm trying to move more to native application, native mobile applications. Um, if you want to learn anything, don't follow me on Twitter. Um, I have a GitHub account, and if you guys have any clients that aren't really good at paying the bills, you might have this kind of thing following you around GitHub. This has been on my, my GitHub account for I think maybe like six months now, and I haven't just found a way to remove it with CSS, but yep, that's fun. Um, so I've been talking at my meetups and kind of, I've been thinking often recently a lot about goals and goal setting, and there's this one framework for goal setting called um, it's called SMART Goals, and let me see if I can get this acronym right. It's um, but what specific, um, measurable, achievable. I'm really good at this. Um, R is for relevant, and then T is for time-based. So I am m more interested in the in the measurable and the time-based part of it. That's kind of what I really focus on, um, and I and I think that goals aren't just good for bringing you to your endpoint and, and focusing you on it. It's more, for me, the best thing about goals is that I can really kind of, I have, I have a lot of productivity problems. Being a freelancer, it's easy to, and being someone that's really interested in, in learning a lot of things, it's really easy to kind of f start doing things and rationalizing what I'm doing, like reading articles about Go or reading the Go standard library those kinds of things. I can say, oh, I'm learning right now, um, so it's okay that I'm doing this instead of working on the thing that I'm supposed to be working on. Um, so goals really help me. I can, I can stop every like 20 minutes, 30 minutes and say, is the thing that I'm doing right now the thing that will get me toward this goal that I've decided on? And if it is, then I continue to do it. If not, I stop immediately and then go back to that thing. Um, this has been really, really, really helpful for me. So I also like to give myself little challenges and St stuff about like diet or productivity or those kinds of things. And my latest, my latest challenge was a 30-day challenge about kind of about reading source code. So I decided that I would spend 30 days each day. I would read one source code repo on GitHub. Um, I decided that my next kind of medium size API will be written in Go, and that I would try to make the Go code as idiomatic as I possibly could. So I'm going to take a little aside to talk about what, what I think idiomatic means. And it's not really 
the structures, the, the, the built-in things for your programming language. It's more the kind of the, the bigger ideas, the way you kind of bring those structures into a way, the common ways that make things kind of more readable, make more sense. Um, but they're often not, to, to newcomers, they're often not, they don't make a lot of sense. But once you kind of start using them, once you start reading the code, you start to, oh, this makes a lot of sense, and it says what I want to say really, really, really briefly. So, um, for example, this is a built-in in Go, a select statement. Um, and this is what I would say is just like a built-in part of the language. But this example, you're using a select statement still, but you're, using, you're creating a function that's calling itself um, that you're sending into a Go routine, which is a very, very common pattern in Go. Um, and then you have an infinite loop that you are, are using your select statement in that's waiting for incoming, it's waiting for channels to dump things off. And at the bottom of that, you have... A, a timeout that's going to happen. So there's a, there's a few kind of idioms, I think, going on here, but it's more of a, like, if I came right into Go, I, wouldn't, I would have no idea, especially what this timeout meant, or why am I doing this self-calling function, but after you start to use the language, you go, oh, actually, this makes a lot of sense, and it's kind of awesome. It's a, this is some, one thing that I really like about Go. So back to the challenge, I decided that I would pick repos that were more, like, kind of the, the prolific Go code writers on, on GitHub. Like, for example, like HashiCorp and SPF13, um, Code Gangsta, which is fun to say. And because the, the, the main reason for this was because I wanted to see, are these people that are writing all this Go code using different kinds of patterns that I'm going to be able to pick up on and maybe use that in my own coding? Um, so the results of my challenge. Um, it's, it's probably no surprise that it's actually really, really hard to do one repo per day. Like, even a small repo, if you want to get very much out of it, reading it is, it takes hours sometimes. Like, jumping through the code, it takes hours. Um, so, what I decided was, probably more realistic goal if you want to do this yourself, is to do one repo a week. Um, just make it, make it a little bit, spread it out. Um, and spend like an, a half hour to an hour per day on it. Um, so, I want to talk about reading source code. Um, I think that source code reading should be, so when you get home from work, I, you probably, maybe you don't want to look at code. I think the people that, that came to this conference specifically, um, you really like code, you love code sometimes. You, like, I know I love to read code, I love to look at it, I, I love to write it. Um, and, I think that maybe when you get home and you're like, I want to read a book or I want to watch a show, like my, my favorite things to do are to read, maybe read articles or, or watch a show when I get home or in the evening. Instead of doing that, maybe instead take some time to just sit down and read a GitHub repo or read part of one. Um, so when, I, when I'm doing this, I have two different kinds of modes. There's a certain mode that I'm like, oh, I just like, I want to get in there, I want to learn some stuff. And this is what I would more consider like the active mode where I would actually use an editor to read the source code. Um, then there's a more kind of passive mode where I, I just open my browser. I'm like, eh, I kind of want to do this. I, I will, I'll read some source code for a few minutes. All right, that's cool. And I will, I'll just open up GitHub, maybe even on like a tablet or something, and then just go through and jump around. Um, and it, you don't really get the same benefits you get from using your editor. You don't get the, you can't jump around as easily to things. You can't see all of your your different packages and all of those things, you kind of have to like, it's pretty slow. And especially if you have a bad internet connection, it can be really obnoxious. So um, my first recommendation for, for when you get into a new repo is to learn the API. Get in there, like read the readme. Always read, I mean it's the RTFM, but I don't know how people are about language here. So. Um, get in there, read the README. Often, a lot of these projects that I looked at, especially since they're more, higher, they're more high profile, they have an actual site that you can go to where they have documentation that's beautiful sometimes that you read through. And this way you get an idea of how you're actually supposed to use the code. Um, this helps a lot when you're starting to read the code because sometimes you can get dropped into a main function and you're like, I have no idea what this person's trying to do. Especially if you're doing the GitHub style, where you, you can't jump to, to method definitions or function definitions. Um, so learn the API. Um, this project 
It was mentioned actually last night at the, uh, at the before meetup. Um, Code, Gangs Code Gangsta, um, CLI, is, is used in a lot of projects. And, it, and what it is, if you're not familiar with it, is it's a tool to um, make it very, very easy to create a Go um, command line application. And it just, so you're taking in your, your arguments to the command line, and you can create commands very, very easily. Um, this also helps you find out where kind of the guts of the application, the, the, whatever you're reading, the, where the guts of it are. If it's a library, you're out of luck. Um, so my next step is always, this is one thing that I really like about go get, is I can just go get and look at where, what the URL is for the, the repo that I'm looking at, and it just takes that and puts it into my go path source, GitHub, that package, and then I can open that in my editor. So before, the way that I would do this is I had some, some folder on my, on my computer called repos, and I would git clone that, and then there was no way for me to really kind of track where things were. I had no idea where anything was. So this, like, there you go, it's right there. It's in your import statement. Um, so look for your entry points. Just, just do a package search for, for your main function, or if you're using a, a library, search for package and then whatever your, your library's name is. Um, and that's generally, a lot of the time if you search for func, func main, what you will end up finding is kind of a lot of main functions, which will often be, this is something that I've seen from, from reading some code, is there'll be a CMD or a command directory that people use. So I'm actually going to take a step aside real quick. Um, if, you're, if you're working, I'm, I'm, I'm a Rails, I'm a Ruby guy. If you're, if you're using something like Rails, it's so opinionated that you know where everything is. You can jump back into a Rails project and it, maybe you worked on it five years ago, and you can look, oh, there's where my error is, and you can find it pretty much instantly a lot of the time, because you know how it's supposed to be set up. With Go, it's a lot less opinionated in this way, and it's really hard to find sometimes what you're actually looking for, unless you're doing a lot of searching around. So this is some kind of pattern that I've seen as a, as a commands or a CMD um, folder, and that's where they put, that's where people put a lot of their kind of entry points in the program. Maybe there's a server, maybe there's um, something that builds files, and all of those entry points will usually be in that folder. Um, so if you're using an editor, download the, to the Go tools. Um, you probably already have. If you haven't, do it. It's, um, I actually, I'm a Vim user, and Vim Go kind of stomped on all of my other Vim stuff, which made me really unhappy. So I started using Atom as my, as my Go editor, but it kind of feels not really ready to me for some reason. So I moved from Atom then to Sublime, which was what I was using before Vim. So it's kind of this, this circle. But it turns out that Go Sublime's, like the, the, the tool set for Sublime for Go is awesome. Like they, they um, the, the build tools, the formatting, all of those things are really, really good. But use the tools for your editor. Um, and Frances talked about this, but I'm gonna talk about it again for a second. Go imports, if you're not using it, I actually should have turned around and saw how many hands were up. Um, I'm actually, I'm going to, uh, sorry, who, who uses Go, Go imports already? Okay, so there's a lot that don't, good. Um, yeah, you do it for autosave. What he showed was that when you, when you have thumped and then you save it, it will automatically add that import statement, the package statement, or sorry, the import statement, like I said first. Um, but what it also does is when you remove that thump statement, it removes the import statement for you. So you don't get those kind of obnoxious, you're not using this package compile errors anymore. Um, I, I was, I'm so happy with this. It's also like, so if you're, if you're familiar, familiar with using uh, my favorite editor, Eclipse, and you're writing one of my favorite programming languages, Java, if you, um, if you save it and then I think it's Command O, like Command Shift O or something like that, we'll do the same thing for Java. So if you are a Java programmer, um, yeah, you may have done that before. Um, so I also wanted to look for patterns, like, like look, for, look for patterns in the code that you're, that you're reading. Like look, look for as many patterns as you can possibly find. Um, Glenn, ah, that's the wrong guy. So also one thing that you can do is record all of the things. So when you're doing this, record all of the information that you're getting. I'm using Typeform and Trello. Typeform is a web app that you can create really interactive, simple forms for free, and it's awesome. And you just, I would give questions like, um, one out of 10, what's the documentation quality, the code quality? Um, I would have 
text areas for what is your favorite kind of parts of the code. I could give lines, directly give lines to the GitHub repo, like a link to the GitHub repo and those kinds of things. And then I have that set up to automatically push those, that information to Trello. So I had cards with my, the different repos in one side and then my results in another side. And it's really easy to kind of go through later and review what you've done. Um, so in 2006, I, 2005, I left Seattle, I left the States and moved to Europe to learn how to cook better. I, I went to Italy, I was supposed to work in restaurants in Italy. Um, I took my bicycle with me and I rode through Spain and part of Italy. I went to lots of different places. It was kind of, I, I met a guy who told me that it was a really good idea to ride your bicycle on the, on the interstate. Um, so he had actually ridden from where? From Los Angeles to Baltimore, and then from, he had ridden from Portugal to where I met him in Spain. And he was like, yeah, just ride on the interstate. It's a good idea. So it's 43 degrees, which is what, 110 or something degrees Fahrenheit. And um, I'm riding on the interstate. I had sunburns below my biker shorts, and I was miserable. And also, if you ever go on a bicycle tour, go with someone else, because when you go alone, you have no one to complain to. So um, I ended up getting to, to Italy and the restaurants. All the plans fell through, and I was like, what am I going to do? So what I ended up doing was I ended up volunteering on farms. So volunteering on farms is actually really, really fun. I really recommend it to anyone to maybe, there's, a, there's an organization called WOOF, which is Willing Workers on Organic Farms, where you kind of just work for food. Um, I, this is in Tuscany, there's a lot of sheep, I guess I'm kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> so, um, being a shepherd is awesome, like you, you, you control this like huge flock of sheep and they kind of go where you want them to and it's silent and you can hear them like chewing and it's really, you're just, you can think and, and, and really like kind of just think about life, think about all these things. And um, this one, um, what was her name? Um, freckles. This is what we. This is the sheep we called freckles. But um, so I actually I, I should never run for office because this power that I felt, even for for like pushing sheep around, like if I ever was the president of anything, like horrible things would happen. <laughs> um, so there's certain code I think that like kind of it just it 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 wants to. It, you can read it. You can you can push it. You can feel it. It kind of it has this like you have this power over it. Something that that I really like, one of the things that I found was that I really like when people name errors. So this is actually in the standard library. It's in uh, Bytes Buffer. Um, it's everywhere actually in the standard library. But it makes it so when you're panicking, you can tell it why. You're not just, oh, panicking error, um, and then give it, and then read the string, and you're like, what's happening over here? What's happening over here? You have this reusable thing that explains exactly what it is that you're doing. Um, another Good example that I found, um, a lot of people love to use factories. There's factories everywhere in, in people's source code in Go. Um, you have a new something, new whatever it is, and then you build it inside of, the, inside of the function and return it, and then you have the new whatever thing that you're working with. This, this made code, I guess maybe coming from more object-oriented programming languages, this made stuff make more sense to me. I think it's also something when people are writing C code that they want to be more object-oriented. It's kind of a similar pattern that I've seen in C code. Um, yeah, so I, after, after like two years after I was on, this, on these farms, I ended up going and working in the mountains in Switzerland um, with a bunch of goats. So we had 100 goats. Um, it was here in that cottage. We, would, we didn't have any refrigeration, so we would milk and make cheese twice a day and send the goats up to, not the mountain in the back, but this mountain on the side every day to kind of sometimes go up by themselves, sometimes we, we went up with them. And um, here's kind of a blurry picture of all the goats. We would actually milk them in this field. It was, it was awesome. Um, I, had, I got really, really strong forearms. Um, so this is actually, this is up on the mountain with the goats. They're just hanging out. So the thing about, the thing about herding goats <laughs> is that goats really don't, care about being herded. They, they're very individual. They, they, they kind of, like, I really love goats. They're really similar to dogs to me. They, they kind of, they know what's going on. They're kind of, they, they, have, they all have their individual personalities. Um, 
This is, you can kind of see a better picture of like the size and the, the amount of the goats. Um, this is up on the hill too. So I actually kind of had to sometimes climb a mountain every day too, which is ridiculous. But um, the goats are really individual. Like if dogs come after the goats, they will kick or like try and headbutt the dogs. So I found some code examples that kind of felt like really individualistic. They didn't really give a crap about who was reading it. And um, these, <laughs> this is, this is actually an actual example from like a, a, a library that's used a lot. And these, see, these are like, this, this is I'm, my opinions definitely. Like a lot of people are probably going to disagree with this. But so just because the language is called Go doesn't mean that you should use um, a GoTo. Um, so one of the problems with GoTos are that you have to share the state between when the GoTo is happening and after the GoTo is, is happening. So... And this we have, th this is another thing. So you have, in Go you have these, um, you can name your return statements and then, um, and then you can assign them within your code. So what's happening here is there's, there's a data interface, um, which I don't, I don't even know what that's going to be. And then in the first part of the code, you're going to end if there's an error. So in end, you're returning data and error. So I already like, can't read this because I don't know where data, where is data? Like where is data being assigned here? It turns out that it's just, I think it's nil. Someone knows that, yes? Um, it's nil, but I haven't assigned it. I don't know where it's coming from. It's kind of magical and yeah. So there's a, there's a few things happening here that are just not my, not my cup of tea. So another thing is this, is, this happens a lot and this is something else that it, it bothers me, but not a lot of other people, is um, a global variable like a, that you're using in lots of your files. And it's, it happens a lot with database clients because you want to open a client and then have it somewhere open and then be able to, to get to it from everywhere. But when I read this code inside of a, inside of a function somewhere in some, other, in some other part of the package, I mean, with this, in this case, it's maybe not a great example because it says data, DB client, and I know what that is. But it's used for other things as well. And I would say, like, if you need a database connection on a struct, maybe um, use, the data, use the struct for the database connection. If you need a database connection in a function, if you're using it outside of something, then send a pointer to the database connection inside of your, your arguments to the function. Um, so another thing that I saw that I actually don't have a slide for is really huge functions, like functions with with 60, 70 lines. And sometimes I can see like a big function, you don't need to refactor into a bunch of different things, but a lot of the time it's just, it seems to me really unnecessary to, it's, it's really hard to read to know what's going on in each section of these, of these huge functions. Pull out little sections of that, maybe name a function, something that makes more sense, something more readable, so I can look at the code and I know what's happening. Um, so, read source code. Um, try and make it a leisure activity. Try and, try and spend extra time or time that you'd be doing with something else to actually look at and, and read source code. Um, if you want to level up in these ways that Frances talked about from to explore and to builder and to expert, reading other people's code, reading your own code is a really, really good way to make those kinds of transitions. Um, look for all the, as many patterns as you can find. It's actually really hard to find patterns, I found. That's another thing that I learned from this whole process is it's, it's difficult to actually find people's patterns. Um, and look for the good and the bad. Try and say, I actually don't want to do that. Um, and get out of your comfort zone. So for example, if you are a, a Go shop, if you're, if you're a startup that's coming here and you want to start using Go, if you are developers that want to learn Go better, um, maybe if you don't want to take time to read other people's code, instead take time to, to take your own source code, the source code of whatever project you're working on, and spend 30 minutes, 15 minutes a day, maybe the first thing that you do in the day, to look at parts of the code that you haven't looked at in a long time. I know being a developer that's working on a team of one most of the time, I, there's so many parts of that code base that I haven't worked on for months. And if I get an error, I have no idea where that error is coming from a lot of the time. But if you spend time to actually read through all of your code or parts of your code, look at it, familiar, familiarize yourself with it, um, it can go really, really a long way. You'll have more of your code base actually in your head, in your, in your memory. Um, and thank you very, very much again for making it possible for me to come out here.